This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenna Lee. Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell. Chapter 53 Unlooked for Arrivals. Robinson opened the door for Molly almost before the carriage had fairly drawn up at the hall, and told her that the squire had been very anxious for her return, and had more than once sent him to an upstairs window, from which a glimpse of the hill road between Hollingford and Hamley could be perceived, to know if the carriage was not yet in sight. Molly went into the drawing-room. The squire was standing in the middle of the floor, awaiting her, in fact, longing to go out and meet her, but restrained by a feeling of solemn etiquette, which prevented his moving about as usual in that house of mourning. He held a paper in his hands, which were trembling with excitement and emotion, and four or five open letters were strewed on a table near him. "'It's all true,' he began. "'She's his wife, and he's her husband. Was her husband. That's the word for it. Was. Poor lad, poor lad. It's cost him a deal. Pray God it was not my fault. Read this, my dear. It's a certificate.' It's all regular, Osborne Hamley to Marie Amy Scherer, parish church and all, and witnessed. Oh, dear, he sat down in the nearest chair and groaned. Molly took a seat by him and read the legal paper, the perusal of which was not needed to convince her of the fact of the marriage. She held it in her hand after she had finished reading it, waiting for the squire's next coherent words, for he kept talking to himself in broken sentences. Ay, ay, that comes of temper and crabbedness. She was the only one as could— and I've been worse since she was gone. Worse, worse, and see what it has come to. He was afraid of me. Aye, afraid. That's the truth of it, afraid. And it made him keep all to himself, and care killed him. They may call it heart disease. Oh, my lad, my lad, I know better now. But it's too late. That's the sting of it. Too late, too late. He covered his face and moved himself backwards and forwards till Molly could bear it no longer. "'There are some letters,' said she. "'May I read any of them?' At another time she would not have asked, but she was driven to it now by her impatience of the speechless grief of the old man. "'Aye, read em, read em, said he. "'Maybe you can. I can only pick out a word here and there. I put em there for you to look at, and tell me what is in em. Molly's knowledge of written French of the present day was not so great as her knowledge of the French of the Memoir de Sully, and neither the spelling nor the writing of the letters was the best but she managed to translate into good enough colloquial English some innocent sentences of love, in submission to Osborne's will, as if his judgment was infallible, and faith in his purposes, little sentences in little language that went home to the squire's heart. Perhaps if Molly had read French more easily, she might not have translated them into such touching, homely, broken words. Here and there, there were expressions in English. These the hungry-hearted squire had read while waiting for Molly's return. Every time she stopped, he said, "'Go on.' He kept his face shaded, and only repeated these two words at every pause. She got up to find some more of Amy's letters, and examining the papers, she came upon one in particular. "'Have you seen this, sir? This certificate of baptism,' reading aloud, "'of Roger Stephen Osborne Hamley, born June twenty-first, 1830-blank, child of Osborne Hamley and Marie Amy, his wife.' "'Give it me,' said the squire, his voice breaking now, and stretching forth his eager hand. "'Roger, that's me. Stephen, that's my poor old father. He died when he was not so old as I am, but I've always thought on him as very old. He was main and fond of Osborne, when he was quite a little one. It's good of the lad to have thought on my father Stephen. Ay, that was his name. And Osborne, Osborne Hamley. One Osborne Hamley lies dead in his bed, and the other—' The other I have never seen, and never heard on till to-day. He must be called Osborne, Molly. There is a Roger. There's two for that matter, but one is a good-for-nothing old man, and there's never an Osborne any more, unless this little thing is called Osborne. We'll take him here, and get a nurse for him, and make his mother comfortable for life in her own country. I'll keep this, Molly. You're a good lass for finding it. Osborne Hamley, and if God will give me grace, he shall never hear a cross word from me. Never! He shan't be afeard of me. Oh, my Osborne, my Osborne, he burst out. Do you know how bitter and sore is my heart for every hard word as I ever spoke to you? Do you know now how I loved you, my boy, my boy? From the general tone of the letters, Molly doubted if the mother would consent, so easily as the squire seemed to expect, 
to be parted from her child. The letters were not very wise, perhaps, though of this Molly never thought, but a heart full of love spoke tender words in every line. Still, it was not for Molly to talk of this doubt of hers just then, rather to dwell on the probable graces and charms of the little Roger Stephen Osborne Hanley. She let the squire exhaust himself in wondering as to the particulars of every event, helping him out in conjectures, and both of them, from their imperfect knowledge of possibilities, made the most curious, fantastic, and improbable guesses at the truth. And so that day passed over, and the night came. There were not many people who had any right to be invited to the funeral, and of these Mr. Gibson and the squire's hereditary man of business had taken charge. But when Mr. Gibson came, early on the following morning, Molly referred the question to him, which had suggested itself to her mind, though apparently not to the squire's. What intimation of her loss should be sent to the widow, living solitary near Winchester, watching and waiting, if not for his coming who lay dead in his distant home, at least for his letters. A letter had already come in her foreign handwriting to the post office, to which all her communications were usually sent, but of course they at the hall knew nothing of this. "'She must be told,' said Mr. Gibson, musing. "'Yes, she must,' replied his daughter. "'But how?' "'A day or two of waiting will do no harm,' said he, almost as if he was anxious to delay the solution of the problem." It will make her anxious, poor thing, and all sorts of gloomy possibilities will suggest themselves to her mind, amongst them the truth. It will be a kind of preparation. For what? Something must be done at last, said Molly. Yes, true. Suppose you write and say he's very ill. Write tomorrow. I dare say they have indulged themselves in daily postage, and then she'll have had three days silence. You say how you come to know all how and about it. I think she ought to know he is very ill, in great danger if you like and you can follow it up next day with the full truth. I would not worry the squire about it. After the funeral we will have a talk about the child. She will never part with it, said Molly. Phew! Till I see the woman I can't tell, said her father. Some women would. It will be well provided for, according to what you say, and she is a foreigner, and may very likely wish to go back to her own people and kindred. There's much to be said on both sides. So you always say, Papa, but in this case I think you'll find I'm right. I judge from her letters, but I think I'm right. So you always say, daughter. Time will show. So the child is a boy? Mrs. Gibson told me particularly to ask. It will go far to reconciling her to Cynthia's dismissal of Roger. But indeed, it is quite as well for both of them, though of course he will be a long time before he thinks so. They were not suited to each other. Poor Roger. It was hard work writing to him yesterday, and who knows what may have become of him. Well, well, one has to get through the world somehow. I'm glad, however, this little lad has turned up to be the heir. I should not have liked the property to go to the Irish Hamleys, who are the next heirs, as Osborne once told me. Now write that letter, Molly, to the poor little French woman out yonder. It will prepare her for it, and we must think a bit how to spare her the shock, for Osborne's sake. The writing this letter was rather difficult work for Molly, and she tore up two or three copies before she could manage it to her satisfaction. And at last, in despair of ever doing it better, she sent it off without rereading it. The next day was easier. The fact of Osborne's death was told briefly and tenderly. But when the second letter was sent off, Molly's heart began to bleed for the poor creature, bereft of her husband, in a foreign land, and he at a distance from her, dead and buried without her ever having the chance of printing his dear features on her memory by one last long, lingering look. With her thoughts full of the unknown Amy, Molly talked much about her that day to the squire. He would listen forever to any conjecture, however wild, about the grandchild, but perpetually winced away from all discourse about the Frenchwoman, as he called her. Not unkindly, but to his mind she was simply the Frenchwoman, chattering, dark-eyed, demonstrative, and possibly even rouged. He would treat her with respect as his son's widow, and would try even not to think upon the female unveilment in which he believed. He would make her an allowance to the extent of his duty, but he hoped and trusted he might never be called upon to see her. His solicitor, Gibson, anybody and everybody, should be called upon to form a phalanx of defense against that danger. And all this time a little young, gray-eyed woman was making her way, not towards him, but towards the dead son, whom as yet she believed to be her living husband. She knew she was acting in defiance of his expressed wish, but he had never dismayed her with any expression of his own fears about his health, and she, bright with life, had never contemplated death coming to fetch away one so beloved. He was ill, very ill. The letter from the strange girl had said that, 
but Amy had nursed her parents and knew what illness was. The French doctor had praised her skill and neat-handedness as a nurse, and even if she had been the clumsiest of women, was he not her husband, her all? And was she not his wife, whose place was by his pillow? So without even as much reasoning as has been here given, Amy made her preparations, swallowing down the tears that would overflow her eyes, and drop into the little trunk she was packing so neatly. And by her side, on the ground, sat the child, now nearly two years old, and for him Amy had always a smile and a cheerful word. Her servant loved her and trusted her, and the woman was of an age to have had experience of humankind. Amy had told her that her husband was ill, and the servant had known enough of the household history to know that as yet Amy was not his acknowledged wife. But she sympathized with the prompt decision of her mistress to go to him directly, wherever he was. Caution comes from education of one kind or another, and Amy was not dismayed by warnings. Only the woman pleaded hard for the child to be left. He was such company, she said, and he would so tire his mother in her journeying, and maybe his father would be too ill to see him. To which Amy replied, Good company for you, but better for me. A woman is never tired with carrying her own child, which was not true, but there was sufficient truth in it to make it be believed by both mistress and servant. And if Monsieur could care for anything, he would rejoice to hear the babble of his little son. So Amy caught the evening coach to London at the nearest crossroad, Martha standing by as chaperone and friend to see her off, and handed her and the large lusty child, already crowing with delight at the sight of the horses. There was a lingerie shop kept by a French woman whose acquaintance Amy had made in the days when she was a London nursemaid, and thither she betook herself, rather than to a hotel, to spend the few night hours that intervened before the Birmingham coach started at early morning. She slept or watched on a sofa in the parlor, for spare bed there was none, but Madame Pauline came in betimes with a good cup of coffee for the mother, and of soup blanche for the boy and they went off again into the wide world, only thinking of, only seeking the him who was everything human to both. Amy remembered the sound of the name of the village where Osborne had often told her that he alighted from the coach to walk home, and though she never could have spelt the strange uncouth word, yet she spoke it with pretty slow distinctiveness to the guard, asking him in her broken English when they should arrive there, not till four o'clock. Alas, and what might happen before then? Once with him she should have no fear." She was sure that she could bring him round, but what might not happen before he was in her tender care? She was a very capable person in many ways, though so childish and innocent in others. She made up her mind to the course she should pursue when the coach set her down at Feversham. She asked for a man to carry her trunk and show her the way to Hamley Hall. "'Hamley Hall,' said the innkeeper. "'Eh, there's a deal of trouble there just now.' "'I know, I know,' said she, hastening off after the wheelbarrow in which her trunk was going, and breathlessly struggling to keep up with it, her heavy child asleep in her arms. Her pulses beat all over her body. She could hardly see out of her eyes. To her, a foreigner, the drawn blinds of the house when she came inside of it, had no significance. She hurried, stumbled on. "'Back door or front, missus?' asked the boots from the inn. "'The most nearest,' said she, and the front door was the most nearest.' Molly was sitting with the squire in the darkened drawing-room, reading out her translations of Amy's letters to her husband. The squire was never weary of hearing them. The very sound of Molly's voice soothed and comforted him. It was so sweet and low. And he pulled her up, much as a child does, if on a second reading of the same letter she substituted one word for another. The house was very still this afternoon, still as it had been now for several days. Every servant in it, however needless, moving about on tiptoe, speaking below the breath, and shutting doors as softly as might be. The nearest noise or stir of active life was that of the rooks in the trees, who were beginning their spring chatter of business. Suddenly, through this quiet, there came a ring at the front doorbell that sounded, and went on sounding through the house, pulled by an ignorant, vigorous hand. Molly stopped reading. She and the squire looked at each other in surprised dismay. Perhaps the thought of Roger's sudden and impossible return was in the mind of each, but neither spoke. They heard Robinson hurrying to answer the unwanted summons. They listened, but they heard no more. There was little more to hear. When the old servant opened the door, a lady with a child in her arms stood there. She gasped out her ready-prepared English sentence. "'Can I see Mr. Osborne Hamley? He is ill, I know, but I am his wife.' Robinson had been aware that there was some mystery, long suspected by the servants, and come to light at last to the master. He had guessed that there was a young woman in the case, but when she stood there before him, asking for her dead husband as if he were living, 
Any presence of mind Robinson might have had forsook him. He could not tell her the truth. He could only leave the door open and say to her, "'Wait a while, I'll come back,' and betake himself to the drawing-room where Molly was, he knew. He went up to her in a flutter and a hurry, and whispered something to her which turned her white with dismay. "'What is it? What is it?' said the squire, trembling with excitement. "'Don't keep it from me. I can bear it. Roger!' They both thought he was going to faint. He had risen up and come close to Molly. Suspense would be worse than anything. "'Mrs. Osborne Hamley is here,' said Molly. "'I wrote to tell her her husband was very ill, and she has come.' "'She does not know what has happened, seemingly,' said Robinson. "'I can't see her. I can't see her,' said the squire, shrinking away into a corner. "'You will go, Molly, won't you? You'll go.' Molly stood for a moment or two, irresolute. She, too, shrank from the interview. Robinson put in his word. She looks but a weakly thing, and has carried a big baby. Choose how far, I did not stop to ask. At this instant the door softly opened, and right into the midst of them came the little figure in gray, ready to fall with the weight of her child. "'You are Molly,' said she, not seeing the squire at once. "'The lady who wrote the letter. He spoke of you sometimes. You will let me go to him.' Molly did not answer, except that at such moments the eyes speak solemnly and comprehensively. Amy read their meaning. All she said was, "'He is not—oh, my husband, my husband!' Her arms relaxed, her figure swayed, the child screamed and held out his arms for help. That help was given him by his grandfather, just before Amy fell senseless on the floor. "'My man, my man!' cried the little fellow, now striving and fighting to get back to her, where she lay. He fought so lustily that the squire had to put him down, and he crawled to the poor inanimate body, behind which sat Molly, holding the head, whilst Robinson rushed away for water, wine, and more womankind. "'Poor thing!' "'Poor thing,' said the squire, bending over her, and crying afresh over her suffering. "'She is but young, Molly, and she must have loved him dearly.' "'To be sure,' said Molly quickly. She was untying the bonnet and taking off the worn but neatly mended gloves. There was the soft, luxuriant black hair, shading the pale, innocent face, the little notable-looking brown hands with the wedding ring for sole ornament. The child clustered his fingers round one of hers, and nestled up against her with his plaintive cry— getting more and more into a burst of wailing. "'Maman! Maman!' At the growing acuteness of his imploring, her hand moved, her lips quivered, consciousness came partially back. She did not open her eyes, but great heavy tears stole out from beneath her eyelashes. Molly held her head against her own breast, and they tried to give her wine, which she drank from, water which she did not reject. That was all. At last she tried to speak. "'Take me away,' she said, "'into the dark. Leave me alone.' So Molly and the woman lifted her up and carried her away, and laid her on the bed in the best bedchamber in the house, and darkened the already shaded light. She was like an unconscious corpse herself, in that she offered neither assistance nor resistance to all that they were doing. But just before Molly was leaving the room to take up her watch outside the door, she felt rather than heard Amy spoke to her. Food, bread and milk for baby— but when they brought her food herself, she only shrank away and turned her face to the wall without a word. In the hurry, the child had been left with Robinson and the squire. For some unknown but most fortunate reason, he took a dislike to Robinson's red face and hoarse voice, and showed a most decided preference for his grandfather. When Molly came down, she found the squire feeding the child, with more of peace upon his face than there had been for all these days. The boy was every now and then leaving off taking his bread and milk to show his dislike to Robinson by word and gesture, a proceeding which only amused the old servant while it highly delighted the more favored squire. She is laying very still, but she will neither speak nor eat. I don't even think she is crying, said Molly, volunteering this account, for the squire was for the moment too much absorbed in his grandson to ask many questions. Robinson put in his word. Dick Hayward, he's boots at the Hamley Arms, says the coach she come by, started at five this morning from London, and the passengers said she'd been crying a deal on the road, when she thought folks were not noticing, and she never came in to meals with the rest, but stopped feeding her child. She'll be tired out, we must let her rest, said the squire, and I do believe this little chap is going to sleep in my arms. God bless him. But Molly stole out and sent off a lad to Hollingford with a note to her father, her heart had warmed towards the poor stranger, and she felt uncertain as to what ought to be the course pursued in her case. She went up from time to time to look at the girl, scarce older than herself, who lay there with her eyes open, but as motionless as death. 
She softly covered her over and let her feel the sympathetic presence from time to time, and that was all she was allowed to do. The squire was curiously absorbed in the child, but Molly's supreme tenderness was for the mother. Not but what she admired the sturdy, gallant, healthy little fellow, whose every limb and square inch of clothing showed the tender and thrifty care that had been taken of him. By and by the squire said in a whisper, "'She is not like a Frenchwoman, is she, Molly?' "'I don't know. I don't know what French women are like. People say Cynthia is French.' "'And she did not look like a servant? We won't speak of Cynthia since she served my Roger so. Why, I begin to think, as soon as I could think after that, how I would make Roger and her happy, and have them married at once. And then came that letter. I never wanted her for a daughter-in-law, not I, but he did, it seems, and he was not one for wanting many things for himself.' "'But it's all over now, only we won't talk of her, "'and maybe, as you say, she was more French than English. "'The poor thing looks like a gentlewoman, I think. "'I hope she's got friends who'll take care of her. "'She can't be above twenty. "'I thought she must be older than my poor lad.' "'She's a gentle, pretty creature,' said Molly. "'But—but but I sometimes think it has killed her. "'She lies like one dead.' "'And Molly could not keep from crying softly at the thought. "'Nay, nay,' said the squire. It's not so easy to break one's heart. Sometimes I've wished it were, but one has to go on living, all the appointed days, as it says in the Bible. But we'll do our best for her. We'll not think of letting her go away till she's fit to travel. Molly wondered in her heart about this going away, on which the squire seemed fully resolved. She was sure that he intended to keep the child, perhaps he had a legal right to do so, but would the mother ever part from it? Her father, however, would solve the difficulty. Her father, whom she always looked to as so clear-seeing and experienced, she watched and waited for his coming. The February evening drew on. The child lay asleep in the squire's arms till his grandfather grew tired, and laid him down on the sofa, the large square-cornered yellow sofa upon which Mrs. Hamley used to sit, supported by pillows in a half-reclining position. Since her time it had been placed against the wall, and had served merely as a piece of furniture to fill up the room. But once again a human figure was lying upon it, a little human creature, like a cherub in some old Italian picture. The squire remembered his wife as he put the child down. He thought of her as he said to Molly, "'How pleased she would have been!' But Molly thought of the young widow upstairs. Amy was her she at the first moment. Presently, but it seemed a long, long time first, she heard the quick prompt sounds which told of her father's arrival. In he came, to the room, as yet only lighted by the fitful blaze of the fire. End of chapter 53 Unlooked for Arrivals Wives and Daughters This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell. Chapter 54. Molly Gibson's Worth is Discovered. Mr. Gibson came in rubbing his hands after his frosty ride. Molly judged from the look in his eye that he had been fully informed of the present state of things at the hall by someone but he simply went up to and greeted the squire, and waited to hear what was said to him. The squire was fumbling at the taper on the writing-table, and before he answered much he lighted it, and signing to his friend to follow him, he went softly to the sofa and showed him the sleeping child, taking the utmost care not to arouse it by flare or sound. "'Well, this is a fine young gentleman,' said Mr. Gibson, "'returning to the fire rather sooner than the squire expected. "'And you've got the mother here, I understand. "'Mrs. Osborne Hamley, as we must call her. "'Poor thing! "'It's a sad coming home to her, "'for I hear she knew nothing of his death.' "'He spoke without exactly addressing anyone, "'so that either Molly or the squire might answer as they liked. "'The squire said, "'Yes, she has felt it a terrible shock. "'She's upstairs in the best bedroom. "'I should like you to see her, Gibson, if she'll let you. "'We must do our duty by her, for my poor lad's sake. "'I wish he could have seen his boy lying there. "'I do. "'I dare say it preyed on him to have to keep it all to himself. 
He might a known me, though. He might a known my bark was war than my bite. It's all over now, though, and God forgive me if I was too sharp. I'm punished now. Molly grew impatient on the mother's behalf. Papa, I feel as if she was very ill, perhaps worse than we think. Will you go and see her at once? Mr. Gibson followed her upstairs, and the squire came too, thinking that he would do his duty now, and even feeling some self-satisfaction at conquering his desire to stay with the child. They went into the room where she had been taken. She lay quite still in the same position as at first. Her eyes were open and tearless, fixed on the wall. Mr. Gibson spoke to her, but she did not answer. He lifted her hand to feel her pulse. She never noticed. "'Bring me some wine at once, and order some beef tea,' he said to Molly. But when he tried to put the wine into her mouth as she lay there on her side, she made no effort to receive or swallow it, and it ran out upon the pillow. Mr. Gibson left the room abruptly. Molly chafed the little inanimate hand. The squire stood by in dumb dismay, touched in spite of himself by the death and life of one so young, and who must have been so much beloved. Mr. Gibson came back two steps at a time, and he was carrying the half-awakened child in his arms. He did not scruple to rouse him into yet further wakefulness, did not grieve to hear him begin to wail and cry. His eyes were on the figure upon the bed, which at that sound quivered all through, and when her child was laid at her back, and began caressingly to scramble yet closer, Amy turned round and took him to her arms, and lulled him and soothed him with the soft want of mother's love. Before she lost this faint consciousness, which was habit or instinct rather than thought, Mr. Gibson spoke to her in French. The child's one word of maman had given him this clue. It was the language sure to be most intelligible to her dulled brain, and as it happened, only Mr. Gibson did not think of that. It was the language in which she had been commanded and had learnt to obey. Mr. Gibson's tongue was a little stiff at first, but by and by he spoke it with all his old readiness. He extorted from her short answers at first, then longer ones, and from time to time he plied her with little drops of wine until some further nourishment should be at hand. Molly was struck by her father's low tones of comfort and sympathy, although she could not follow what was said quickly enough to catch the meaning of what passed. By and by, however, when her father had done all that he could, and they were once more downstairs, he told them more about her journey than they yet knew. The hurry the sense of acting in defiance of a prohibition, the overmastering anxiety, the broken night, and fatigue of the journey, had ill-prepared her for the shock at last. And Mr. Gibson was seriously alarmed for the consequences. She had wandered strangely in her replies to him, had perceived that she was wandering, and had made great efforts to recall her senses. But Mr. Gibson foresaw that some bodily illness was coming on, and stopped late that night arranging many things with Molly and the squire. One, the only comfort arising from her state, was the probability that she would be entirely unconscious by the morrow, the day of the funeral. Worn out by the contending emotions of the day, the squire seemed now unable to look beyond the wrench and trial of the next twelve hours. He sat with his head in his hands, declining to go to bed, refusing to dwell on the thought of his grandchild, not three hours ago such a darling in his eyes. Mr. Gibson gave some instructions to one of the maid-servants as to the watch she was to keep by Mrs. Osborne Hamley, and insisted on Molly's going to bed. When she pleaded the apparent necessity of her staying up, he said, "'Now, Molly, look how much less trouble the dear old squire would give if he would obey orders.' He is only adding to anxiety by indulging himself. One pardons everything to extreme grief, however. But you will have enough to do to occupy all your strength for days to come. And go to bed, you must now. I only wish I saw my way as clearly through other things as I do to your nearest duty.' 
I wish I'd never let Roger go wandering off. He'll wish it too, poor fellow. Did I tell you Cynthia is going off in hot haste to her Uncle Kirkpatrick's? I suspect a visit to him will stand in lieu of going out to Russia as a governess. I am sure she was quite serious in wishing for that. Yes, yes, at the time. I've no doubt she thought she was sincere in intending to go. But the great thing was to get out of the unpleasantness of the present time and place. And Uncle Kirkpatrick's will do this as effectually and more pleasantly than a situation at Nishni Novgorod in an ice palace. He had given Molly's thoughts a turn, which was what he wanted to do. Molly could not help remembering Mr. Henderson and his offer, and all the consequent hints, and wondering and wishing. What did she wish, or had she been falling asleep? Before she had quite ascertained this point, she was asleep in reality. After this, long days passed over in a monotonous round of care, for no one seemed to think of Molly's leaving the hall during the woeful illness that befell Mrs. Osborne Hamley. It was not that her father allowed her to take much active part in the nursing. The squire gave him carte blanche, and he engaged two efficient hospital nurses to watch over the unconscious A.M.A. But Molly was needed to receive the finer directions as to her treatment and diet. It was not that she was wanted for the care of the little boy— the squire was too jealous of the child's exclusive love for that. And one of the housemaids was employed in the actual physical charge of him, but he needed someone to listen to his incontinence of language, both when his passionate regret for his dead son came uppermost, and also when he had discovered some extraordinary charm in that son's child. And again when he was oppressed with the uncertainty of A. May's long-continued illness, Molly was not so good or so bewitching a listener to ordinary conversation as Cynthia. But where her heart was interested, her sympathy was deep and unfailing. In this case she only wished that the squire could really feel that A. May was not the encumbrance which he evidently considered her to be. Not that he would have acknowledged the fact, if it had been put before him in plain words. He fought against the dim consciousness of what was in his mind. He spoke repeatedly of patience when no one but himself was impatient. He would often say that when she grew better she must not be allowed to leave the hall until she was perfectly strong. When no one was even contemplating the remotest chance of her leaving her child, except only himself. Molly once or twice asked her father if she might not speak to the squire and represent the hardship of sending her away, the improbability that she would consent to quit her boy, and so on. But Mr. Gibson only replied, Wait quietly, time enough when nature and circumstance have had their chance and have failed. It was well that Molly was such a favorite with the old servants, for she had frequently to restrain and to control. To be sure, she had her father's authority to back her, and they were aware that where her own comfort, ease, or pleasure was concerned, she never interfered, but submitted to their will. If the squire had known of the want of attendance to which she submitted with the most perfect meekness, as far as herself, was the only sufferer, he would have gone into a towering rage. But Molly hardly thought of it, so anxious was she to do all she could for others, and to remember the various charges which her father gave her in his daily visits. Perhaps he did not spare her enough. She was willing and uncomplaining. But one day, after Mrs. Osborne Hamley had taken the turn, as the nurses called it, when she was lying weak as a newborn baby, but with her faculties all restored, and her fever gone, when spring buds were blooming out, and the spring birds sang merrily, Molly answered to her father's sudden questioning that she felt unaccountably weary, that her head ached heavily, and that she was aware of a sluggishness of thought which it required a painful effort to overcome. "'Don't go on,' said Mr. Gibson, with a quick pang of anxiety, almost of remorse. "'Lie down here with your back to the light. I'll come back and see you before I go.' And off he went in search of the squire. He had a good long walk before he came upon Mr. Hamley in a field of spring wheat, 
where the women were weeding, his little grandson holding to his finger, in the intervals of short walks of inquiry into the dirtiest places, which was all his sturdy little limbs could manage. "'Well, Gibson, and how goes the patient? Better? I wish we could get her out of doors. Such a fine day as it is. It would make her strong as soon as anything. I used to beg my poor lad to come out more. Maybe I worried him, but the air is the finest thing for strengthening that I know of, though perhaps she'll not thrive in English air as if she'd been born here. And she'll not be quite right till she gets back to her native place, wherever that is. I don't know. I begin to think we shall get her quite round here, and I don't know that she could do it in a better place. But it is not about her. May I order the carriage for my Molly? Mr. Gibson's voice sounded as if he was choking a little as he said these last words. To be sure, said the squire, setting the child down. He had been holding him in his arms the last few minutes, but now he wanted all his eyes to look into Mr. Gibson's face. I say, said he, catching hold of Mr. Gibson's arm, what's the matter, man? Don't twitch up your face like that, but speak. Nothing's the matter, said Mr. Gibson hastily, only I want her at home under my own eye. And he turned away to go to the house. But the squire left his field and his weeders and kept at Mr. Gibson's side. He wanted to speak, but his heart was so full he did not know what to say. I say, Gibson, he got out at last, your Molly is liker a child of mine than a stranger, and I reckon we've all of us been coming too hard upon her. You don't think there's much amiss, do you? How can I tell, said Mr. Gibson, almost savagely. But any hastiness of temper was instinctively understood by the squire, and he was not offended, though he did not speak again till they reached the house. Then he went to order the carriage, and stood by sorrowful enough while the horses were being put in. He felt as if he should not know what to do without Molly. He had never known her value, he thought, till now. But he kept silence on this view of the case, which was a praiseworthy effort on the part of one who usually let bystanders see and hear as much of his passing feelings as if he had had a window in his breast. He stood by while Mr. Gibson helped the faintly smiling, tearful Molly into the carriage. Then the squire mounted on the step and kissed her hand, but when he tried to thank her and bless her, he broke down, and as soon as he was once more safely on the ground, Mr. Gibson cried out to the coachman to drive on. And so Molly left Hamley Hall. From time to time her father rode up to the window and made some little cheerful and apparently careless remark. When they came within two miles of Hollingford, he put spurs to his horse and rode briskly past the carriage windows, kissing his hand to the occupant as he did so. He went on to prepare her home for Molly. When she arrived, Mrs. Gibson was ready to greet her. Mr. Gibson had given one or two of his bright, imperative orders, and Mrs. Gibson was feeling rather lonely without either of her two dear girls at home, as she phrased it, to herself, as well as to others. "'Why, my sweet Molly, this is an unexpected pleasure. "'Only this morning I said to Papa, "'When do you think we shall see our Molly back?' "'He did not say much, he never does, you know, "'but I am sure he thought directly of giving me this surprise, this pleasure. "'You're looking a little, what shall I call it? "'I remember such a pretty line of poetry. "'Oh, I call her fair, not pale. "'So we'll call you fair.' "'You'd better not call her anything but let her get to her own room "'and have a good rest as soon as possible. "'Haven't you got a trashy novel or two in the house? "'That's the literature to send her to sleep.' "'He did not leave her till he had seen her laid on a sofa in a darkened room, "'with some slight pretense of reading in her hand. "'Then he came away, leading his wife, "'who turned round at the door to kiss her hand to Molly "'and make a little face of unwillingness to be dragged away.' "'Now, Hyacinth,' said he, as he took his wife into the drawing-room, "'she will need much care. She has been overworked, and I've been a fool. That's all. "'We must keep her from all worry and care, but I won't answer for it "'that she'll not have an illness for all that.' 
"'Poor thing! She does look worn out. "'She is something like me. "'Her feelings are too much for her. "'But now she has come home, "'she shall find us as cheerful as possible. "'I can answer for myself, "'and you really must brighten up "'your doleful face, my dear. "'Nothing so bad for invalids "'as the appearance of depression "'in those around them. "'I have had such a pleasant letter "'from Cynthia to-day. "'Uncle Kirkpatrick really seems "'to make so much of her.' He treats her just like a daughter. He has given her a ticket to the concerts of ancient music, and Mr. Henderson has been to call on her, in spite of all that has gone before. For an instant Mr. Gibson thought that it was easy enough for his wife to be cheerful, with the pleasant thoughts and evident anticipations she had in her mind, but a little more difficult for him to put off his doleful looks while his own child lay in a state of suffering and illness which might be the precursor of a still worse malady. But he was always a man for immediate action as soon as he had resolved on the course to be taken, and he knew that some must watch while some must sleep, so runs the wicked world. The illness which he apprehended came upon Molly not violently or acutely, so that there was any immediate danger to be dreaded. But making a long pull upon her strength, which seemed to lessen day by day, until at last her father feared that she might become a permanent invalid. There was nothing very decided or alarming to tell Cynthia, and Mrs. Gibson kept the dark side from her in her letters. Molly was feeling the spring weather, or Molly had been a good deal overdone with her stay at the hall and was resting. Such little sentences told nothing of Molly's real state. But then, as Mrs. Gibson said to herself, it would be a pity to disturb Cynthia's pleasure by telling her much about Molly. Indeed, there was not much to tell. One day was so like another. But it so happened that Lady Harriet, who came whenever she could to sit a while with Molly, at first against Mrs. Gibson's will, and afterwards with her full support, for reasons of her own, Lady Harriet wrote a letter to Cynthia, to which she was urged by Mrs. Gibson. It fell out in this manner. One day, when Lady Harriet was sitting in the drawing-room for a few minutes, after she had been with Molly, she said, "'Really, Clare, I spend so much time in your house that I am going to establish a work-basket here. Mary has infected me with her notability, and I am going to work Mamma a footstool.' It is to be a surprise, and so if I do it here, she will know nothing about it. Only I cannot match the gold beads I want for the pansies in this dear little town. And Hollingford, who could send me down stars and planets if I asked him, I make no doubt, could no more match beads than— My dear Lady Harriet, you forget Cynthia. Think what a pleasure it would be to her to do anything for you. Would it? Then she shall have plenty of it. "'But mind, it is you who have answered for her. "'She shall get me some wool, too. "'How good I am to confer so much pleasure on a fellow creature. "'But seriously, do you think I might write and give her a few commissions? "'Neither Agnes nor Mary are in town.' "'I am sure she would be delighted,' said Mrs. Gibson, "'who also took into consideration the reflection of aristocratic honour "'that would fall upon Cynthia if she had a letter from a Lady Harriet." while at Mr. Kirkpatrick's. So she gave the address, and Lady Harriet wrote. All the first part of the letter was taken up with apology and commissions, but then, never doubting but that Cynthia was aware of Molly's state, she went on to say, I saw Molly this morning. Twice I have been forbidden admittance, as she was too ill to see anyone out of her own family. I wish we could begin to perceive a change for the better, but she looks more fading every time, and I fear Mr. Gibson considers it a very anxious case. The day but one after this letter was dispatched, Cynthia walked into the drawing-room at home with as much apparent composure as if she had not left it an hour before. Mrs. Gibson was dozing, but believing herself to be reading, she had been with Molly the greater part of the morning, and now after her lunch— and the invalid's pretense of early dinner, she considered herself entitled to some repose. She started up as Cynthia came in. "'Cynthia, dear child, where have you come from? Why in the world have you come? My poor nerves!' 
"'My heart is quite fluttering. "'But to be sure it's no wonder "'with all this anxiety I have to undergo. "'Why have you come back?' "'Because of the anxiety you speak of, Mamma. "'I never knew. "'You never told me how ill Molly was.' "'Nonsense. "'I beg your pardon, my dear, "'but it's really nonsense. "'Molly's illness is only nervous.' "'Mr. Gibson says, a nervous fever. "'But you must remember nerves are mere fancy, "'and she's getting better. "'Such a pity for you to have left your uncles. "'Who told you about Molly?' "'Lady Harriet. "'She wrote about some wool. "'I know, I know, but you must have known. "'She always exaggerates things. "'Not but what I have been almost worn out with nursing. "'Perhaps, after all, it is a very good thing you have come, my dear.' "'and now you shall come down into the dining-room "'and have some lunch, "'and tell me all the Hyde Park Street news "'into my room. "'Don't go into yours yet. "'Molly is so sensitive to noise.' "'While Cynthia ate her lunch, "'Mrs. Gibson went on questioning. "'And your aunt? "'How is her cold? "'And Helen quite strong again? "'Margaretta as pretty as ever? "'The boys are at Harrow, I suppose. "'And my old favourite, Mr. Henderson?' She could not manage to slip in this last inquiry, naturally. In spite of herself there was a change of tone, an accent of eagerness. Cynthia did not reply on the instant. She poured herself out some water with great deliberation, and then said, "'My aunt is quite well. Helen is as strong as she ever is, and Margaretta very pretty. The boys are at Harrow, and I conclude that Mr. Henderson is enjoying his usual health "'for he was to dine at my uncle's to-day. "'Take care, Cynthia. "'Look how you are cutting that gooseberry tart,' "'said Mrs. Gibson, with sharp annoyance, "'not provoked by Cynthia's present action, "'although it gave excuse for a little vent of temper. "'I can't think how you could come off "'in this sudden kind of way. "'I am sure it must have annoyed your uncle and aunt. "'I dare say they'll never ask you again.' "'On the contrary, I am to go back there as soon as ever I can be easy to leave Molly.' "'Easy to leave Molly? Now that really is nonsense, and rather uncomplimentary to me, I must say. Nursing her, as I have been doing, daily and almost nightly, for I have been wakened times out of number by Mr. Gibson getting up, and going to see if she had had her medicine properly.' "'I am afraid she has been very ill?' asked Cynthia. "'Yes, she has in one way, but not in another. "'It was what I call more a tedious than an interesting illness. "'There was no immediate danger, "'but she lay much in the same state from day to day. "'I wish I had known,' sighed Cynthia. "'Do you think I might go and see her now? "'I'll go and prepare her. "'You'll find her a good deal better than she has been. "'Ah, here's Mr. Gibson.' "'He came into the dining-room hearing voices.' "'Cynthia thought that he looked much older. "'You here?' said he, coming forward to shake hands. "'Why, how did you come?' "'By the umpire. "'I never knew Molly had been so ill, "'or I would have come directly.' "'Her eyes were full of tears. "'Mr. Gibson was touched. "'He shook her hand again and murmured, "'You're a good girl, Cynthia.' "'She'd heard one of dear Lady Harriet's exaggerated accounts,' said Mrs. Gibson, "'and come straight off. "'I tell her it's very foolish, for really Molly is in a great deal better now.' "'Very foolish,' said Mr. Gibson, echoing his wife's words, but smiling at Cynthia. "'But sometimes one likes foolish people for their folly, better than wise people for their wisdom.' "'I am afraid folly always annoys me,' said his wife. "'However, Cynthia is here, and what is done is done. "'Very true, my dear, and now I'll run up and see my little girl "'and tell her the good news. "'You'd better follow me in a couple of minutes.' "'This to Cynthia. "'Molly's delight at seeing her showed itself first in a few happy tears, "'and then in soft caresses and inarticulate sounds of love. "'Once or twice she began, "'It is such a pleasure,' and there she stopped short. "'but the eloquence of these five words "'sank deep into Cynthia's heart. "'She had returned just at the right time "'when Molly wanted the gentle Philip "'of the society of a fresh and yet familiar person. "'Cynthia's tact made her talkative or silent, 
gay or grave, as the varying humor of Molly required. She listened, too, with the semblance, if not the reality, of unwearied interest to Molly's continual recurrence to all the time of distress and sorrow at Hamley Hall, and to the scenes which had then so deeply impressed themselves upon her susceptible nature. Cynthia instinctively knew that the repetition of all these painful recollections would ease the oppressed memory, which refused to dwell on anything but what had occurred at a time of feverish disturbance of health. So she never interrupted Molly, as Mrs. Gibson had so frequently done, with, "'You told me all that before, my dear. Let us talk of something else.' Or, "'Really, I cannot allow you to be always dwelling on painful thoughts. Try and be a little more cheerful.' "'Youth is gay. You are young, and therefore you ought to be gay. "'That is put in a famous form of speech. "'I forget exactly what it is called.' "'So Molly's health and spirits improved rapidly after Cynthia's return, "'and although she was likely to retain many of her invalid habits during the summer, "'she was able to take drives and enjoy the fine weather. "'It was only her as yet tender spirits that required a little management.' All the Hollingford people forgot that they had ever thought of her, except as the darling of the town, and each, in his or her way, showed kind interest in her father's child. Miss Browning and Miss Phoebe considered it quite a privilege that they were allowed to see her a fortnight or three weeks before anyone else. Mrs. Goodenough, spectacles on nose, stirred dainty messes in a silver saucepan for Molly's benefit. The towers sent books and forced fruit, and new caricatures, and strange and delicate poultry. Humble patience of the doctor, as Mr. Gibson was usually termed, left the earliest cauliflowers they could grow in their cottage gardens with their duty for miss. And last of all, though strongest in regard, most piteously eager in interest, came Squire Hamley himself. When she was at the worst, he rode over every day to hear the smallest detail, facing even Mrs. Gibson, his abomination, if her husband was not at home, to ask and hear, and ask and hear, till the tears were unconsciously stealing down his cheeks. Every resource of his heart, or his house, or his lands, was searched and tried, if it could not bring a moment's pleasure to her, and whatever it might be that came from him, at her very worst, it brought out a dim smile upon her face." End of chapter 54「LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell Chapter 55 An Absent Lover Returns And now it was late June, and to Molly's and her father's extreme urgency in pushing, and Mr. and Mrs. Kirkpatrick's affectionate persistency in pulling, Cynthia had yielded and had gone back to finish her interrupted visit in London but not before the bruit of her previous sudden return to Nurse Molly had told strongly in her favour in the fluctuating opinion of the little town. Her affair with Mr. Preston was thrust into the shade, while every one was speaking of her warm heart. Under the gleam of Molly's recovery everything assumed a rosy hue, as indeed became the time when actual roses were actually in bloom. One morning Mrs. Gibson brought Molly a great basket of flowers that had been sent from the hall. Molly still breakfast in bed, but had just come down and was now well enough to arrange the flowers for the drawing room, and as she did so with these blossoms, she made some comments on each. Ah, these white pinks, they were Mrs. Hamley's favourite flower, and so like her, this little bit of sweet briar, it quite sensed the room. It has pricked my fingers, but never mind. Oh, Mamma, look at this rose. I forget its name, but it is very rare and grows up in the sheltered corner of the wall, near the mulberry tree. 
Roger bought the tree for his mother with his own money when he was quite a boy. He showed it to me and made me notice it. I dare say it was Roger who got it now. You heard Papa say he had seen him yesterday. No, Roger. Roger come home, said Molly, turning first red, then very white. Yes, oh, I remember you had gone to bed before Papa came in, and he was called off early to tie some Mrs. Beale. Yes, Roger turned up at the hall the day before yesterday. But Molly leaned back against her chair, too faint to do more at the flowers for some time. She had been startled by the suddenness of the news. Roger come home. It happened that Mr. Gibson was unusually busy on this particular day, and he did not return until late in the afternoon. But Molly kept her place in the drawing-room all the time, not even going to take her customary siesta. So anxious was she to hear everything about Roger's return, which as yet appeared to her almost incredible. But it was quite natural in reality. The long monotony of her illness had made her lose all count of time. When Roger left England, his idea was to coast round Africa on the eastern side until he reached the Cape, and thence to make what further journey or voyage might seem to him best in pursuit of his scientific objects. To Cape Town all his letters had been addressed of late, and there, two months before, he had received the intelligence of Osborne's death, as well as Cynthia's hasty letter of relinquishment. He did not consider that he was doing wrong in returning to England immediately, and reporting himself to the gentleman who had sent him out, with a full explanation of the circumstances relating to Osborne's private marriage and sudden death. He offered, and they accepted his offer, to go out again for any time that they might think equivalent to the five months he was yet engaged to them for. They were most of them gentlemen of property, and saw the full importance of proving the marriage of an elder son, and installing his child as the natural heir to a long-descended estate. This much information, but in more condensed form, Mr. Gibson gave to Molly in a very few minutes, she sat up on her sofa, looking very pretty with the flush on her cheeks and the brightness in her eyes. Well, said she, when her father stopped speaking. Well, what? asked he playfully. Oh, why, such a number of things. I've been waiting all day to ask you all about everything. How is he looking? If a young man of twenty-four ever does take to growing taller, I should say that he was taller. As it is, I suppose it is only that he looks broader, stronger, more muscular. Oh, is he changed? asked Molly, a little disturbed by this account. No, not changed, and yet not the same. He is as brown as a berry, for one thing, caught a little of the negro tinge, and a beard as fine and sweeping as my bay mare's tail. A beard? But go on, Papa. Does he talk as he used to do? I should know his voice amongst ten thousand. I did not catch any hot and twat twang, if that's what you mean, nor did he say Caesar and Pompey very much alike, especially Pompey, which is the only specimen of Negro language I can remember just at this moment, and which I never could see the wit of, said Mrs. Gibson, who had come into the room after the conversation had begun and did not understand what it was aiming at. Molly fidgeted. She wanted to go on with her questions, and keep her father to definite and matter-of-fact answers, and she knew that when his wife chimed into a conversation, Mr. Gibson was very apt to find out that he must go about some necessary piece of business. Tell me, how are they all getting on together? It was an inquiry which she did not make in general before Mrs. Gibson, for Molly and her father had tacitly agreed to keep silence on what they knew or had observed, respecting the three who formed the present family at the hall. Oh, said Mr. Gibson, Roger is evidently putting everything to rights in his firm, quiet way, 
Things to rights? Why, what's wrong? asked Mrs. Gibson quickly. The squire and the French daughter-in-law don't get on well together. I suppose I'm always so glad Cynthia acted with the promptitude she did. It would have been very awkward for her to have been mixed up with all these complications. Poor Roger, to find himself supplanted by a child when he comes home. You were not in the room, my dear, when I was telling Molly of the reasons for Roger's return. It was to put his brother's child at once into his rightful and legal place. So now, when he finds the work partly done to his hands, he is happy and gratified in proportion. Then he is not much affected by Cynthia's breaking off her engagement. Mrs. Gibson could afford to call it an engagement now. I never did give him credit for very deep feelings. On the contrary, he feels it very acutely. He and I had a long talk about it yesterday. Both Molly and Mrs. Gibson would have liked to have heard something more about this conversation, but Mr. Gibson did not choose to go on with the subject. The only point which he disclosed was that Roger had insisted on his right to have a personal interview with Cynthia, and... On hearing that she was in London at present, had deferred any further explanation or expostulation by letter, preferring to wait her return. Molly went on with her questions on other subjects, and Mrs. Osborne Hamley, how is she? Wonderfully brightened up by Roger's presence. I don't think I have ever seen her smile before, but she gives him the sweetest smiles from time to time. They are evidently good friends, and she loses her strange, startled look when she speaks to him. I suspect she has been quite aware of the squire's wish that she should return to France, and has been hard put to it to decide whether to leave her child or not. The idea that she would have to make some such decision came upon her when she was completely shattered by grief and illness and she has not had any one to consult as to her duty until Roger came, upon whom she has evidently firm reliance. He told me something of this himself. You seem to have had quite a long conversation with him, Papa. Yes, I was going to see old Abraham when the squire called to me over the hedge as I was jogging along. He told me the news and there was no resisting his invitation to come back and lunch with them. Besides, one gets a great deal of meaning out of Roger's words. It did not take so very long a time to hear this much. I should think he would come and call upon us soon, said Mrs. Gibson to Molly, and then we shall see how much we can manage to hear. Do you think he will, Papa? said Molly, more doubtfully. She remembered the last time he was in that very room, and the hopes with which he left it, and she fancied that she could see traces of this thought in her father's countenance at his wife's speech. I cannot tell, my dear, until he is quite convinced of Cynthia's intentions. It cannot be very pleasant for him to come on mere visits of ceremony to the house in which he has known her, but he is one who will always do what he thinks right, whether pleasant or not. Mrs. Gibson could hardly wait till her husband had finished his sentence before she testified against a part of it. Convinced of Cynthia's intentions, I should think she had made them pretty clear. What more does the man want? He is not as yet convinced that the letter was not written in a fit of temporary feeling. I have told him that this was true although I did not feel it my place to explain to him the causes of that feeling. He believes that he can induce her to resume the former footing. I do not, and I have told him so, but of course he needs the full conviction that she alone can give him. Poor Cynthia, my poor child, said Mrs. Gibson plaintively, what she has exposed herself to by letting herself be over-persuaded by that man. Mr. Gibson's eyes flashed fire, but he kept his lips tight closed, and only said, That man, indeed, quite below his breath. Molly, too, had been damped by an expression or two in her father's speech. Mere visits of ceremony? Was it so, indeed? 
a mere visit of ceremony. Whatever it was, the call was paid before many days were over, that he felt all the awkwardness of his position towards Mrs. Gibson, that he was in reality suffering pain all the time, was but too evident to Molly. But of course Mrs. Gibson saw nothing of this in her gratification at the proper respect paid to her by one whose name was already in the newspapers that chronicled his return, and about whom already Lord Cumnor and the Towers family had been making inquiry. Molly was sitting in her pretty white invalid's dress, half reading, half dreaming, for the June air was so clear and ambient, the garden so full of bloom, the tree so full of leaf, that reading by the open window was only a pretense at such a time, besides which Mrs. Gibson continually interrupted her with remarks about the pattern of her worsted work. It was after lunch, orthodox calling time, when Marie ushered in Mr. Roger Hamley. Molly started up, and then stood shyly and quietly in her place, while a bronzed, bearded, grave man came into the room, in whom she at first had to seek for the merry boyish face she knew by heart only two years ago. But months in the climates in which Roger had been travelling age as much as years in more temperate districts, and constant thought and anxiety while in daily peril of life deepened the lines of character upon a face. Moreover, the circumstances that had of late affected him personally were not of a nature to make him either buoyant or cheerful, but his voice was the same. That was the first point of the old friend Molly caught, when he addressed her in a tone far softer than he used in speaking conventional politeness to her stepmother. I was so sorry to hear how ill you had been. You are looking but delicate letting his eyes rest upon her face with affectionate examination. Molly felt herself colour all over with the consciousness of his regard. To do something to put an end to it, she looked up and showed him her beautiful soft grey eyes, which he never remembered to have noticed before. She smiled at him as she blushed still deeper and said, Oh, I am quite strong now to what I was. It would be a shame to be ill when everything is in its full summer beauty. I have heard how deeply we, I am indebted to you. My father can hardly praise you. Please don't, said Molly, the tears coming into her eyes in spite of herself. He seemed to understand her at once. He went on as if speaking to Mrs. Gibson. Indeed, my little sister-in-law is never weary of talking about Monsieur le Docteur, as she calls your husband. I have not had the pleasure of making Mrs. Osborne Hamley's acquaintance yet, said Mrs. Gibson, suddenly aware of a duty which might have been expected from her, and I must beg you to apologize to her for my remissness. But Molly has been such a care and anxiety to me, for, you know, I look upon her quite as my own child, that I really have not gone anywhere, excepting to the Towers, perhaps, I should say, which is just like another home to me. And then I understood that Mrs. Osborne Hamley was thinking of returning to France before long. Still, it was very remiss. The little trap thus set for news of what might be going on in the Hamley family was quite successful. Roger answered her thus, I am sure Mrs. Osborne Hamley will be very glad to see any friends of the family, as soon as she is a little stronger. I hope she will not go back to France at all. She is an orphan, and I trust we shall induce her to remain with my father. But at present nothing is arranged. Then, as if glad to have got over his visit of ceremony, he got up and took leave. When he was at the door he looked back, having, as he thought, a word more to say, but he quite forgot what it was, for he surprised Molly's intent gaze and sudden confusion at discovery, and went away as soon as he could. Poor Osborne was right, said he. She had grown into delicate, fragrant beauty, just as he said she would. Or is it the character which has formed the face? 
Now the next time I enter these doors it will be to learn my fate. Mr. Gibson had told his wife of Roger's desire to have a personal interview with Cynthia, rather with a view to her repeating what he said to her daughter. He did not see any exact necessity for this, it is true, but he thought that it might be advisable that she should know all the truth in which she was concerned, and he told his wife this. But she took the affair into her own management, and, although she apparently agreed with Mr. Gibson, she never named the affair to Cynthia. All that she said to her was, "'Your old admirer Roger Hamley has come home in a great hurry in consequence of poor dear Osborne's unexpected disease. He must have been rather surprised to find the widow and her little boy established at the hall. He came to call here the other day and made himself really rather agreeable, although his manners are not improved by the society he has kept on his travels.' Still, I prophesy he will be considered as a fashionable lion, and perhaps the very uncouthness which jars against my sense of refinement may even become admired in a scientific traveller who has been into more desert places and eaten more extraordinary food than any other Englishman of the day. I suppose he has given up all chance of inheriting the estate, for I hear he talks of returning to Africa and becoming a regular wanderer. Your name was not mentioned, but I believe he inquired about you from Mr. Gibson. There, said she to herself, as she folded up and directed this letter, that can't disturb her, or make her uncomfortable. And it's all the truth, too, or very near it. Of course he'll want to see her when she comes back but by that time I do hope Mr. Henderson will have proposed again, and that that affair will be all settled. But Cynthia returned to Hollingford one Tuesday morning, and in answer to her mother's anxious inquiries on the subject, would only say that Mr. Henderson had not offered again. Why should he? She had refused him once, and he did not know the reason of her refusal, at least one of the reasons. She did not know if she should have taken him if there had been no such person as Roger Hamley in the world. No, uncle and aunt Kirkpatrick had never heard anything about Roger's offer, nor had her cousins. She had always declared her wish to keep it a secret, and she had not mentioned it to anyone, whatever other people might have done. Underneath this light and careless vein there were other feelings, but Mrs. Gibson was not one to probe beneath the surface. She had set her heart on Mr. Henderson's marrying Cynthia very early in their acquaintance, and to know, firstly, that the same wish had entered into his head, and that Roger's attachment to Cynthia, with its consequences, had been the obstacle, and secondly, that Cynthia herself, with all the opportunities of propinquity that she had lately had, had failed to provoke a repetition of the offer. It was, as Mrs. Gibson said, enough to provoke a saint. All the rest of the day she alluded to Cynthia as a disappointing and ungrateful daughter. Molly could not make out why, and resented it for Cynthia, until the latter said bitterly, Never mind, Molly. Mamma is only vexed because Mr. Because... I have not come back an engaged young lady. Yes, and I am sure you might have done. There's the ingratitude. I am not so unjust as to want you to do what you can't do, said Mrs. Gibson curiously. But where's the ingratitude, Mamma? I am very much tired, and perhaps that makes me stupid. But I cannot see the ingratitude. Cynthia spoke very wearily, leaning her head back on the sofa cushions, as if she did not much care to have an answer. Why, don't you see we are doing all we can for you, dressing you well and sending you to London, and when you might relieve us of the expense of all this, you don't. No, Cynthia, I will speak, said Molly, all crimson with indignation and pushing away Cynthia's restraining hand. I am sure Papa does not feel, and does not mind, any expense he incurs about his daughters. 
and I know quite well that he does not wish us to marry, unless... She faltered and stopped. Unless what, said Mrs. Gibson, half mocking. Unless we love someone very dearly indeed, said Molly, in a low, firm tone. Well, after this tirade, really rather indelicate, I must say, I have done. I will neither help nor hinder any love affairs of you two young ladies. In my days we were glad of the advice of our elders and she left the room to put into fulfilment an idea which had just struck her, to write a confidential letter to Mrs. Kirkpatrick, giving her her version of Cynthia's unfortunate entanglement and delicate sense of honour, and hints of her entire indifference to all the masculine portion of the world, Mr. Henderson being dexterously excluded from their category. "'Oh, dear,' said Molly, throwing herself back in a chair, with a sigh of relief as Mrs. Gibson left the room. How cross I do get since I have been ill. But I could not bear her to speak as if Papa grudged you anything. I am sure he does not, Molly. You need not defend him on my account. But I am sorry Mamma still looks upon me as an encumbrance, as the advertisements in the Times always call us unfortunate children but I have been an encumbrance to her all my life. I'm getting very much into despair about everything, Molly. I shall try my luck in Russia. I have heard of a situation as English governess at Moscow, in a family owning whole provinces of land, and serfs by the hundred. I put off writing my letter till I came home. I shall be as much out of my way there as if I was married. Oh, dear! Travelling all night is not good for the spirits. How is Mr. Preston? Oh, he has taken Cumnor Grange three miles away, and he never comes in to the Hollingford tea parties now. I saw him once in the street, but it's a question which of us tried the hardest to get out of the other's way. You've not said anything about Roger, yet? No, I did not know if you would care to hear. He is very much older-looking quite a strong grown-up man, and Papa says he is much graver. Ask me any questions if you want to know, but I have only seen him once. I was in hopes he would have left the neighbourhood by this time. Mamma said he was going to travel again. I can't tell, said Molly. I suppose you know, she continued, but hesitating a little before she spoke, that he wishes to see you. No, I never heard. I wish he would have been satisfied with my letter. It was as decided as I could make it. If I say I won't see him, I wonder if his will or mine will be the strongest. His, said Molly, but you must see him. You owe it to him. He will never be satisfied without it. Suppose he talks me round into resuming the engagement. I should only break it off again. Surely you can't be talked round if your mind is made up. But perhaps it is not really, Cynthia, asked she, with a little wistful anxiety betraying itself in her face. It is quite made up. I am going to teach little Russian girls, and am never going to marry nobody. You are not serious, Cynthia. And yet it is a very serious thing. But Cynthia went into one of her wild moods, and no more reason or sensible meaning was to be got out of her at the time. End of chapter 55Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell Chapter 56 Off with the Old Glove and On with the New The next morning saw Mrs. Gibson in a much more contented frame of mind. She had written and posted her letter, and the next thing was to keep Cynthia in what she called a reasonable state, or, in other words, to try and conjole her into docility but it was so much labour lost 
Cynthia had already received a letter from Mr. Henderson before she came down to breakfast. A declaration of love. A proposal of marriage as clear as words could make it, together with an intimation that, unable to wait for the slow delays of the post, he was going to follow her down to Hollingford, and would arrive at the same time that she had done herself on the previous day. Cynthia said nothing about this letter to anyone. She came late into the breakfast room, after Mr. and Mrs. Gibson had finished the actual business of the meal, but her unpunctuality was quite accounted for by the fact that she had been travelling all the night before. Molly was not as yet strong enough to get up so early. Cynthia hardly spoke, and did not touch her food. Mr. Gibson went about his daily business, and Cynthia and her mother were left alone. "'My dear,' said Mrs. Gibson, "'you are not eating your breakfast, as you should do. I am afraid our meals seem very plain and homely to you after those in Hyde Park Street.' "'No,' said Cynthia, "'I'm not hungry, that's all. If we were as rich as your uncle, I should feel it to be both a duty and a pleasure to keep an elegant table, but limited means are a sad clog to one's wishes.' I don't suppose that, work as he will, Mr. Gibson can earn more than he does at present, while the capabilities of the law are boundless. Lord Chancellor, titles as well as fortune. Cynthia was almost too much absorbed in her own reflections to reply, but she did say, Hundreds of briefless barristers take the other side, Mamma. Well, but I have noticed that many of these have private fortunes. Perhaps, Mamma, I expect Mr. Henderson will come and call this morning. Oh, my precious child, but how do you know? My darling Cynthia, am I to congratulate you? No, I suppose I must tell you. I have had a letter this morning from him, and he is coming down by the umpire today. But he has offered. He surely must mean to offer, at any rate. Cynthia played with her teaspoon before she replied. Then she looked up, like one startled from a dream, and caught the echo of her mother's question. Offered? Yes, I suppose he has. And you accept him? Say yes, Cynthia, and make me happy. I shan't say yes to make anyone happy except myself, and the Russian scheme has great charms for me. She said this to plague her mother, and lessen Mrs. Gibson's exuberance of joy. It must be confessed for her mind was pretty well made up, but it did not affect Mrs. Gibson, who affixed even less truth to it than there really was. The idea of a residence in a new, strange country, among new, strange people, was no without allurement to Cynthia. You always look nice, dear, but don't you think you had better put on that pretty lilac silk? I shall not vary a thread or a shred from what I have got on now. You dear, willful creature, you know you always look lovely in whatever you put on. So, kissing her daughter, Mrs. Gibson left the room, intent on the lunch which should impress Mr. Henderson at once with an idea of family refinement. Cynthia went upstairs to Molly. She was inclined to tell her about Mr. Henderson, but she found it impossible to introduce the subject naturally so she left it in time to reveal the future as gradually as it might. Molly was tired with a bad night, and her father, in his flying visit to his darling before going out, had advised her to stay upstairs for the greater part of the morning, and to keep quiet in her own room till after her early dinner, so time had not a fair chance of telling her what he had in store in his budget. Mrs. Gibson sent an apology to Molly for not paying her her usual morning visit, and told Cynthia to give Mr. Henderson's probable coming as a reason for her occupation downstairs. But Cynthia did no such thing. She kissed Molly, and sat silently by her, holding her hand, till at length she jumped up and said, "'You shall be left alone now, little one.' I want you to be very well and very bright this afternoon, so rest now. And Cynthia left her, and went to her own room, locked the door, and began to think. Someone was thinking about her at the same time, and it was not Mr. Henderson, 
Roger had heard from Mr. Gibson that Cynthia had come home, and he was resolving to go to her at once, and have one strong, manly attempt to overcome the obstacles, whatever they might be, and of their nature he was not fully aware that she had conjured up against the continuance of their relationship to each other. He left his father, he left them all, and went off into the woods, to be alone until the time came when he might mount his horse and ride over to put his fate to the touch. He was as careful as ever not to interfere with the morning hours that were tabooed to him of old, but waiting was very hard work when he knew that she was so near, and the time so near at hand. Yet he rode slowly, compelling himself to quietness and patience when he was once really on the way to her. "'Mrs. Gibson at home, Miss Kirkpatrick?' he asked of the servant, Maria, who opened the door. She was confused, but he did not notice it. "'I think so. I'm not sure. Will you walk up into the drawing-room, sir? Miss Gibson is there, I know.' So he went upstairs, all his nerves on one strain for the coming interview with Cynthia. It was either a relief or a disappointment, he was not sure which, to find only Molly in the room. Molly, half lying on the couch in the bow window which commanded the garden, draped in soft white drapery, very white herself, and a laced half-handkerchief tied over her head to save her from any ill effects of the air that blew in through the open window. He was so ready to speak to Cynthia that he hardly knew what to say to anyone else. "'I am afraid you are not so well,' he said to Molly, who sat up to receive him, and who suddenly began to tremble with emotion. "'I am a little tired, that's all,' said she, and then she was quite silent, hoping that he might go, and yet somehow wishing him to stay. But he took a chair and placed it near her, opposite to the window. He thought that surely Maria would tell Miss Kirkpatrick that she was wanted, and that at any moment he might hear her light, quick footstep on the stairs. He thought he ought to talk, but he could not think of anything to say. The pink flush came out on Molly's cheeks, once or twice she was on the point of speaking, but again she thought better of it, and the pauses between the faint disjointed remarks became longer and longer. Suddenly, in one of these pauses, the merry murmur of distant happy voices in the garden came nearer and nearer. Molly looked more and more uneasy and flushed, and in spite of herself kept watching Roger's face. He could see over her into the garden. A sudden deep colour overspread him, as if his heart had sent its blood out coursing at full gallop. Cynthia and Mr. Henderson had come in sight, he eagerly talking to her as he bent forward to look into her face. She, her looks half averted in pretty shyness, was evidently coquetting about some flowers, which she either would not give or would not take. Just then, for the lovers had emerged from the shrubbery into comparatively public life. Maria was seen approaching. Apparently she had feminine tact enough to induce Cynthia to leave her present admirer and go a few steps to meet her to receive the whispered message that Mr. Roger Hamley was there and wished to speak to her. Roger could see her startled gesture she turned back to say something to Mr. Henderson before coming towards the house. Now Roger spoke to Molly, spoke hurriedly, spoke hoarsely. Molly, tell me, it is too late for me to speak to Cynthia. I came on purpose. Who is that man? Mr. Henderson, he only came today, but now he is her accepted lover. Oh, Roger, forgive me the pain. Tell her I have been and am gone. Send out word to her. Don't let her be interrupted. And Roger ran downstairs at full speed, and Molly heard the passionate clang at the outer door. He had hardly left the house before Cynthia entered the room, pale and resolute. Where is he? she said, looking around, as if he might yet be hidden. Gone, said Molly, very faint. Gone? Oh, what a relief! 
It seems to be my fate never to be off with the old lover before I am on with the new, and yet I did write as decidedly as I could. Why, Molly, what's the matter? For now Molly had fainted away utterly. Cynthia flew to the bell, summoned Maria, water, salts, wine, everything, and as soon as Molly, gasping and miserable, became conscious again, she wrote a little pencil note to Mr. Henderson, bidding him return to the George, whence he had come in the morning, and saying that if he obeyed her at once, he might be allowed to call again in the evening, otherwise she would not see him till the next day. This she sent down by Maria, and the unlucky man never believed but that it was Miss Gibson's sudden indisposition in the first instance that had deprived him of his charmer's company. He comforted himself for the long solitary afternoon by writing to tell all his friends of his happiness, and amongst them Uncle and Aunt Kirkpatrick, who received his letter by the same post as that discreet epistle of Mrs. Gibson's, which she had carefully arranged to reveal as much as she wished and no more. Was he very terrible? asked Cynthia, as she sat with Molly in the stillness of Mrs. Gibson's dressing room. Oh, Cynthia, it was such pain to see him. He suffered so. I don't like people of deep feelings, said Cynthia, pouting. They don't suit me. Why could not he let me go without this fuss? I'm not worth his caring for. You have the happy gift of making people love you, remember Mr. Preston. He too would not give up hope. Now I won't have you classing Roger Hamley and Mr. Preston together in the same sentence. One was as much too bad for me as the other is too good. Now I hope that Maxie in the garden is a just malou. I'm that myself, for I don't think I'm vicious and I know I'm not virtuous. Do you really like him enough to marry him? asked Molly earnestly. Do you think, Cynthia, it won't do to go on throwing your lovers off. You give pain that I am sure you do not mean to do, that you cannot understand. Perhaps I can't. I'm not offended. I never set up for what I am not. And I know I'm not constant. I have told Mr. Henderson so. She stopped, blushing and smiling at the recollection. You have? And what did he say? That he liked me just as I was. So you see, he's fairly warned. Only he is a little afraid, I suppose, for he wants me to be married very soon, almost directly, in fact. But I don't know if I shall give way. You hardly saw him, Molly. But he's coming again tonight. And mind, I'll never forgive you if you don't think him very charming. I believe I cared for him when he offered all those months ago, but I tried to think I didn't. Only sometimes I really was so unhappy. I thought I must put an iron band round my heart to keep it from breaking, like the faithful John of the German story. Do you remember, Molly, how when his master came to his crown and his fortune and his lady love, after innumerable trials and disgraces, and was driving away from the church where he'd been married in a coach and six. With faithful John behind, the happy couple heard three great cracks in succession, and on inquiring, they were the iron bands round his heart that faithful John had worn all during the time of his master's tribulation to keep it from breaking. In the evening Mr. Henderson came. Molly had been very curious to see him, and when she saw him she was not sure whether she liked him or not. He was handsome, without being conceited, gentlemanly, without being foolishly fine. He talked easily, and never said a silly thing. He was perfectly well appointed, yet never seemed to have given a thought to his dress. He was good-tempered and kind, not without some of the cheerful flippancy of repartee which belonged to his age and profession and which his age and profession are apt to take for wit. But he wanted something in Molly's eyes, at any rate in this first interview, and in her heart of hearts she thought him rather commonplace. But of course she said nothing of this to Cynthia, who was evidently as happy as she could be, 
Mrs. Gibson, too, was in the seventh heaven of ecstasy and spoke but little, but what she did say expressed the highest sentiments in the finest language. Mr. Gibson was not with them for long, but while he was there he was evidently studying the unconsciousness Mr. Henderson with his dark penetrating eyes. Mr. Henderson behaved exactly as he ought to have done to everybody, respectful to Mr. Gibson, deferential to Mrs. Gibson, friendly to Molly, devoted to Cynthia. The next time Mr. Gibson found Molly alone, he began, Well, and how do you like the new relation that is to be? It is difficult to say. I think he is very nice in all his bits, but rather dull on the whole. I think him perfection, said Mr. Gibson, to Molly's surprise, but in an instant afterwards she saw that he had been speaking ironically. He went on. I don't wonder she preferred him to Roger Hamley. Such scents, such gloves, and then his hair and his cravat. Now, Papa, you are not fair. He is a great deal more than that. One could see that he had very good feeling, and he is very handsome and very much attached to her. So was Roger. However, I must confess I shall only be too glad to have her married. She is a girl who will always have some love affair on hand, and will always be apt to slip through a man's fingers if he does not look sharp, as I was saying to Roger. You have seen him, then, since he was here? Met him in the street. How was he? I don't suppose he had been going through the pleasantest thing in the world, but he'll get over it before long. He spoke with sense and resignation, and did not say much about it, but one could see that he was feeling it pretty sharply. He's had three months to think it over, remember? The squire, I should guess, is showing more indignation. He is boiling over, that any one should reject his son. The enormity of the sin never seems to have been apparent to him till now, when he sees how Roger is affected by it. Indeed, with the exception of myself, I don't know one reasonable father, eh, Molly? Whatever else Mr. Henderson might be, he was an impatient lover. He wanted to marry Cynthia directly, next week, the week after, at any rate, before the long vacation, so that they could go abroad at once, trousseau, and preliminary ceremonies. He gave to the winds. Mr. Gibson, generous as usual, called Cynthia aside a morning or two after her engagement, and put a hundred-pound note into her hands. There, that's to pay your expenses to Russia and back. I hope you'll find your pupils obedient. To his surprise, and rather to his discomfiture, Cynthia threw her arms round his neck and kissed him. You are the kindest person I know, said she, and I don't know how to thank you in words. If you tumble my shirt collars again in that way, I'll charge you for the washing, just now, too, when I'm trying so hard to be trim and elegant, like your Mr. Henderson. But you do like him, don't you? said Cynthia, pleadingly. He does so like you. Of course, we are all angels just now, and you are an archangel. I hope he'll wear as well as Roger. Cynthia looked grave. That was very silly affair, she said. We were two as unsuitable people. It has ended, and that's enough. Besides, I've no more time to waste, and there is your smart young man coming here in all haste. Mr. and Mrs. Kirkpatrick sent all manner of congratulations, and, in a private letter, assured Mrs. Gibson that her ill-time confidence about Roger should be considered as quite private for as soon as Mr. Henderson had made his appearance in Hollingford, she had written a second letter, entreating them not to allude to anything she might have said to her first, which she said was written in such excitement on discovering the real state of her daughter's affections, that she had hardly known what she had said, and had exaggerated some things, and misunderstood others. All that she did know was, that Mr. Henderson had just proposed to Cynthia, and was accepted, and that they were as happy as the day was long, and, 
excuse the vanity of a mother, made a most lovely couple. So Mr. and Mrs. Kirkpatrick wrote back an equally agreeable letter, praising Mr. Henderson, admiring Cynthia, and generally congratulatory, insisting into the bargain that the marriage should take place from their house in Hyde Park Street, and that Mr. and Mrs. Gibson and Molly should all come up and pay them a visit. There was a little postscript at the end. Surely you do not mean the famous traveller, Hamley, about whose discoveries all our scientific men are so much excited. You speak of him as a young Hamley, who went to Africa. Answer this question, pray, for Helen is most anxious to know. This P.S. being in Helen's handwriting, in her exultation at the general success of everything, and desire for sympathy, Mrs. Gibson read parts of this letter to Molly, the postscript among the rest. It made a deeper impression on Molly than ever the proposed kindness of the visit to London. There were some family consultations, but the end of them all was that the Kirkpatrick invitation was accepted. There were many small reasons for this, which were openly acknowledged, but there was one general and unspoken wish to have the ceremony performed out of the immediate neighbourhood of the two men whom Cynthia had previously rejected. That was the word now to be applied to her treatment of them. So Molly was ordered and enjoined and entreated to become strong as soon as possible, in order that her health might not prevent her attending the marriage. Mr. Gibson himself, though he thought it his duty to damp the exultant anticipations of his wife and her daughter, was not at all averse to the prospect of going to London and seeing half a dozen old friends and many scientific exhibitions, independently of the very fair amount of liking which he had for his host, Mr. Kirkpatrick himself. End of chapter 56